Hi, I'm Giles Martin. I'm here in Abbey Road Studio 2. I was actually born in 1969 um, on John Lennon's birthday, which fascinated him. Um, he said to my dad, no, you're not sort of arsehole he's going to turn out to be. Um, it's funny, growing up as a kid, having a father like George Martin, you can't compare it to anything else. I've never actually swapped dads with anyone. Um, but we didn't necessarily, myself and my sister didn't actually grow up in a in a, in a terribly musical house, apart from, as a kid, I noticed my dad played the piano a lot, and odd people would come back and forth. In fact, when I was a playgroup, my, um, they went around the class, and I was about four or five, and they said, you know, what do your parents do for a living? And they, you know, you know, my dad's an accountant, my dad's a lawyer, my dad's a truck driver, whatever. And I said, my dad just sits at home and plays the piano. And it turns out he was writing, I think he was writing the music for Live and Let Die, the film at the time. And there's huge embarrassment amongst my parents. They go, you know, he's not employed, you know, he's got a proper job. And so it wasn't a sort of thing. I think that, I think growing up in, in, a, in a, it was, I didn't necessarily grow up in a musical household. It wasn't, you know, I had the privilege of meeting people like Paul McCartney at an early age and, and, and meeting, you know, the Beatles at an early age, but they were just friends of my parents. It didn't mean a whole lot to me as a kid. Um, I remember when I became interested in the guitar and became interested in songwriting, Paul did say to me, he was incredibly encouraging, he goes, that's great, you know, I find it difficult to write songs and I'm Paul McCartney. So I did have a privileged sort of background as far as that goes. My parents were always uh, very wary of me getting a proper job. They, I learned to play the guitar, as you can, some people might be able to see quite badly, but behind my parents' back, you know, it was a, it was a thing, you know, don't join the music industry. Um, I'm delighted I did. In fact, I really got involved in music because my dad started to lose his hearing when I was about 16 and he needed a second pair of ears and he didn't really want to tell people he was losing his hearing. So I became his ears to a certain extent. I'd come in and try and help him by through that I would learn off him. And we started working together. And it was actually a great thing because I was needed to a certain extent by him, which is nice as a son and a father working together. And at the same time, he was always very good. He never had a sort of, that's my boy kind of attitude. He was always very uh, receptive to my ideas. And the fact he's been receptive to people's ideas throughout the whole of his career. And uh, he treated me no differently and was always open to, to my suggestions, however wrong they may be. And you know, God knows I made lots of wrong ones. So it gave me a chance to learn, it gave me a chance to respect him for what he does and what he's done. I, I never thought of, I was never any good um, at learning songs off by heart. I mean, you know, I bluff my way through most things. I've never been terribly accurate at playing anything. I can play a number of things very badly, but I was much more interested in playing for a reason. So as soon as I learned to play the guitar with a friend of mine, we started playing in the underground here, started playing in tube stations and playing whatever songs we could learn, basically, you know, as you do. And my parents were, my dad was especially distraught by this. He didn't want, you know, George Martin's son being arrested because it's illegal. At that stage, it was illegal to busk. In fact, the way we played it should have been illegal, but it was illegal to busk. And uh, I then got into playing bands. I formed a band, you know, as you do. And I had a great time, I think, playing in a band, learning to play an instrument. Learning to play a guitar was the best thing I ever did. And not that I practice the guitar or play it very often now, but it opens so many doors as far as if you're willing to play it to people, if you're willing to bore people with it. It's great, you know, to meet people and chat. It's like a, a great hobby to have. It's better than video games, for instance. And, and I think that being in a band taught me more about recording and music for enough than being the son of George Martin did. Because people, if you're the son of um, someone, people expect you have this knowledge, which generally you don't have. You know, people think you grew up in recording studios. Of course, I'd spent more time in studios than probably people, other people are 16, but it's still just a row of buttons. You know, if you're 16, it's still just, you know, a compressor. Of course, I know what a compressor does. But I hadn't got a clue for a long time because people expect you to know these things. But if you're in a band, you, especially as I was in an unsuccessful band, you have a chance to make a whole lot of mistakes and learn stuff. And the hardest thing, not that it's a bad thing, but the hardest thing if you're a son of some son of some famous or a child of a famous person is you don't get that many chance, chances to make mistakes before people go, people are hoping for the second coming, people are going, he's going to be just like his dad. And if you screw up, you're then the other way. You're then, he couldn't get a proper job. 
And so being in a sort of hidden band gave me a chance to learn. And that's what, you know, music is about evolving. It's about discovering new stuff. It's about learning new songs. It's about learning how things work. It's not about playing the same old things every day. Then things become boring. After playing in a band, I carried on playing in, I always played in, played with people, always like going on tour and playing in pubs and clubs. So I thought, thought, you know, it's just, it was just great fun. And I started writing jingles, I started writing commercials. Um, I started doing gasoline adverts, that was my, for, for France. French gasoline is, was the peak of my life. And that was when I was at university. And then when I left university, I wanted to become a record producer. I wanted to write music people and produce people, but I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't have any, you know, what do you do? You can't go, I'm the son of George Martin, let me produce you, you know, it's, or, or give me a job. And so I ended up working in press. And at the same time, I started looking at bands. And funny enough, my dad was sort of, he was nervous, I think, of me following in his footsteps at this stage. And I saw a band called My Life Story. They're playing at the, 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 My Life Story, they're playing at the, the Astoria in London. And I went to go see them play and I thought they were good and they were, had a whole lot of strings and I did an arrangement of them and produced them. And they released a single that became sort of number one in Melody Maker and Enemy and the Cool magazines. And someone showed it to my dad and said, look what your son's been up to. And I was just doing it in the evenings, you know, as you do if you're a fan of music and you want to get into music. And that kind of opened doors to me. I left the press job and became a producer. Pro production engineering is, is something that you learn stuff all the time with, like any sort of, sort of music. I mean, I think, for me, starting out and how I am now, if I can work in any form of music, I'm happy. It doesn't matter. It's just, you know, I think um, I produce more stuff now and remix and mix stuff now, probably because in a way it's what people expect of me and maybe I'm okay at it. The Love Project came from, it came from the fact that they needed to do a show. It was uh, George Harrison and Guy Le Liberté, who's the head of Cirque du Soleil, were friends. And they decided to do a show and they decided they couldn't have anyone singing Beatles songs a la Mamma Mia. They didn't want, you know, a chorus singing Hey Jude on stage. And I think that's the right decision. And so they approached my dad and I just had quite a lot of success in the UK doing classical stuff at the time. And Apple came to see me and I sat with my dad and talked to them about it. And I said to them, I could try doing, creating a gig that never happened. And Neil Aspinall, who was the head of Apple, said, you know, I'd love, you know, till we talked about, because he was their roadie, we talked about their shows. We talked about, you know, starting off with Long Tall Sally and finishing with Twist and Shout, or, you know, creating this thing. And I said, well, listen, with Pro Tools and digital stuff, I can perhaps create a gig that never happened. So under complete secrecy, uh, I went upstairs here into a very small room and took some material and I took the beginning, the, sorry, the, the drums from the end and get back because I realized they're the same tempo and because I thought I'd start a gig, never happened with a drum solo going into a song and started moving things around and you know, people said mashing up, I always thought it was a bit rude um, and then thought how am I going to start this and got the piano from a day in the life and turned that backwards because I thought if that makes a good ending it'll make a good beginning as it sucks into the chord from Hard Day's Night. I just had fun, you know, and my view was, you know, if I can impress my dad doing Beatles stuff then that's pretty good, you know, as a son you're always trying to impress your dad I think or, or compete in some way and it just so happened that it was on Beatles stuff and I was auditioning for the Beatles and I really thought that they probably wouldn't like it. You know, I, I really thought that people would think this is a really bad idea. It sounds like a bad idea if you just talk about it. And I then took Within You, Without You and Tomorrow Never Knows and stuck those together because I thought this will definitely get me fired, if nothing else. And they came and they really liked it. They liked the ideas. And so I ended up becoming um, the sort of... <laughs> you know, the sort of legacy which I kind of fought against for a long time, and here I am now in Abbey Road talking about it, um, suddenly became part of it. And uh, I backed up all the catalogue and the Pro Tools and started working on this, on this project, which, which became love. Um, I came with my dog Stan and went to my room and started working, you know, we had a list. I worked with the director of the show and my dad. My dad would come in sort of two days a week and I'd play him ideas and we'd work through stuff. So he was kind of producing me doing it. But the bosses were 
the Beatles, Ringo and Paul, and Olivia, Olivia Harrison and Yoko Ono, who were representing George and John. And it was important that they liked everything. They had to hear everything before it was passed on anywhere, anywhere else. And the interesting thing about the Beatles, it's such a protected circle, rightfully so, that if you do something and no one likes it, no one ever hears it. You know, and that's actually quite a good thing for me because it means I could take risks. You know, occasionally people at Abbey Road were sort of, you know, people who never hadn't heard anything, which the majority of people here didn't like the idea of what we were doing and didn't like the idea of me coming in and changing. People think it's changing history, but it's not because I'm not deleting anything. I wasn't, you know, I, I was just really trying to do something different. And Ringo and Paul would come in. The funny thing is they come and listen to stuff and they're not allowed to take stuff away either. It's not like you give them a CD. The only chance of them listening to the new mixes we were doing was by coming here and listening to them. And then later as we got the technology sorted out and secure drives were done, I would go and see Yoko and sit down with her and work through stuff. And it's fascinating. For me it was fascinating because I have no past with them. You know, I have no, I certainly wasn't there at the time. And so it's kind of on an even, I'm, I'm, I'm way down the pecking order, but it's kind of, I mean, on an even keel, as it were. There's no history, I have no, you know, experience of anything they did. So it was quite easy for me just to go, do you like it or you don't, what, you don't, what don't you like about it? And they were very proactive in it, um, all four of them, you know, the two wives and Ringo and Paul. And, you know, Paul was, Paul was the one that would give me the fear because he's such a good musician. I mean, Ringo is a pretty good musician as well, and they'd, they'd you know, they know their stuff and they know their own material and uh, occasionally in fact when we were doing the show I sat down with Paul I went through each bit and you know played in bits in the theatre and it was great it was a great evening and he goes you know he said to me you know I just I really I, I have to say I really like what you've done and you, what you've done has been sympathetic with my music and I really appreciate that for me that was just you know the best but when, we, when the show, when it came to the opening of the show, at the very beginning when people walk into the theatre and they're sitting down, I couldn't work out what, because they wanted Beatles music to play, and someone said, well, why don't you just do another 60 minutes of, and I mean, it took me two years to do the 90 minutes. So I decided to get as many Beatles on as I could by taking the vocals off, which is difficult with Beatles stuff, because there's so much leakage on the tracks, and just play the backing tracks. So it's like the Beatles are playing, they're backing as you walk in. So you have Dear Prudence with no vocal, you know, you have Should Know Better with no vocal, and Penny Lane with no vocal. And the idea was that it would counterpoint because when because starts, it's just vocals. So I'm sitting with Paul, and he's two, my dad's there, and Paul's there, and Penny Lane's playing in the in the ceiling of the theatre. And Paul goes, and what's this then? And I went, It's Penny Lane. He goes, I know it's bloody Penny Lane, but what is what's it doing in the ceiling? And I said, well, I just thought it would be an idea to, you know, because they listened to everything. I thought it would be an idea to maybe put the backing tracks up there. And he's like, oh, OK, you know, I'll have a listen. And it's right there because it is their music. And, you know, and my dad sometimes, you know, it's, he feels embarrassed because it's, it's not his music and it certainly isn't mine. It is there. It's, they were, there were four Beatles and it was their band and that was it. There's no fifth Beatle. With music, there's things you'd like to do. I'm, I wish I could play things better, you know. I've always thought, you know, it'd be great to, to really learn how to play the bass properly, or guitar properly, or piano properly, you know. Um, but uh, it's just a question of time. Maybe I'll start watching our video tunes and, and then become a better musician. But, you, you know, there's, I'd like to, you know, work with you know, a really good young band. At the same time, I'd love to go and do something like the Love Project with something else, you know, with taking, taking stuff and creating, make people listen to music again. The good thing about Love is it does, people do analyse and people do listen, and people don't have it on the background, they do actually get into it. And that's why we do music, we do music because we're passionate about it. And so, really, I mean, I, I'm about to write a television thing, I'm, you know, you just, it's a question of writing, producing and being creative and anything that lets you do that, you take. And every day, I just can't believe I, I can do this for a living. You know, I was told by my parents for years it's an impossible job to do for a living, despite coming from my background, because I think maybe when I have kids, I'll be doing the same thing, you know, don't go into music, you know. But it's just, it's, you do it because you love it. And, that's, and, and if you can get paid for it, it means you don't have to do another job to get in the way as well, so it's fantastic. I would say to anyone learning an instrument, anyone you know, struggling, because let's face it, we all struggle with instruments all the time, and we struggle with music. 
is that no matter how hard it is, it's hard for everyone. And that love that you have for it, never let go of it. Because you, know, you might be trying to learn a song and go, I'm never going to learn this. But the fact of it is, you do. You do learn and you do move on. And the thing to do is never ever give up. Never ever lose that drive and that, that feeling you get when you work something out or you hear some great music. Because it's much better than sitting down and watching the telly. I mean, the thing about, the thing about music is that I think if anyone's toured, I used to tour a lot, you know, you end up kind of working on automa automatic pilot. And, uh, and you get, you start amusing yourself with stuff. I was playing bass in a band, and you start playing the same things over and over again. And, and uh, I was once in Germany, and I used to jump off the stage. And, and I jumped off the stage, and I had no idea until I left the theater, how far I was jumping. We played the end of the concert, and I jumped off the stage, and there was no crowd there. I mean, let's face it, it wasn't that popular, but there was, there was a break before the people. And I launched off the stage, and seeing the band's faces, and they looked at me, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to die in a, in a shit club in Germany. And I dropped about 12 feet. My bass amp almost followed me, because I you know, didn't have wireless or anything. I just, the bass, <laughs> it was like Wile E. Coyote. The, my lead unraveled. <laughs> it's the only thing that kept me alive. And an Ampeg SV200 over there called, came, came crashing out afterwards. But yeah, I spent most of my time being laughed at by people. You know, I think it's important. I think it's important in studios to have a good laugh. It's funny, I mean, you know, it's, you know, the Beatles. It's one thing, that was, one thing that was shocking for me from listening to all of the tapes, everything they did, was not you know, how serious it was. It was how much kind of fun there is in the tapes. Even when you think, oh, the White Album, they didn't get on. They're really cracking up most of the time. And it's kind of, you forget that actually they came to the studio to have a good time. And all the other stuff you read about happened in offices and accountants and all that sort of stuff. Most of the studio stuff is great. And that's the thing about music. Music should be fun. You know, if you're learning music, have a laugh with it. And don't sit on your own and do it. You know, find someone to play with. Because... Uh, the great thing about music is there's always someone worse than you. you can, I mean, in my case, you really have to hunt them out. But, you know, there is. And so show off to someone. Well, the, I mean, the great thing about the internet is the fact you can, you can delve into the world of songs and work out chords. And one of the problems I struggle from is you look on the internet, and quite often the, the chord sheets are wrong. And there's some guy going, if you know the right way this song goes, please write in. You think, oh, that's no good. I can work that out. And the great thing about iVideo tunes is it breaks down that barrier and you've suddenly been taught by professionals. You've suddenly been taught in a simple way by professionals. It's kind of inspired me. You know, I saw iVideo tunes before, before I got involved in it. And it's inspired me to like going, right, I'm going to see if I can learn the piano better now. You know, and I think that's a great thing. You know, people don't have access to the best people in the world. And now, with iVideo tunes, they do. You can be taught by some of the best people, you know, from home. And the way it's shot and the way it's done is very simple. You know, if I can understand it, it's very simple. So I think it's a great thing. It's a great learning tool for people. And, uh, and I think hopefully it'll, be, it'll create great musicians in the future. I'm here at Abbey Road Studio 2, talking about Revolution. Now, Revolution was recorded on the 9th of July, 1968. Um, funny enough, strangely in some ways, the same day as Obladia Bladar was being recorded, which I think is just kind of shows the Beatles perhaps were going in different directions at the time. Um, or shows their diversity, if you like. It, the reason why there are two revolutions, because there's obviously revolution number one and there's revolution, was John Lennon said in 1980 that Paul and George didn't want revolution to be a single because they didn't think it was fast enough. They didn't think it, it drove enough. So kind of as a reaction to that, he insisted they record the song again, but make it faster. And it certainly was overdriven. I mean, the guitars by today's standards or by any standards are the word distortion. And it's created purely by 
You know, they tried overdriving the amps, which hasn't, if you think about it, I mean, there wasn't much overdriven sounds going on at that time anyway. I mean, 68 was the beginning of, you know, hard, you know, hard rock, Hendrix, you know, and all that sort of stuff. But it's, they did it by DIing part of the guitar signal through the desk upstairs here and just overdriving the channels on the desk. Um, the great thing about the world then is that everything was analog and distortion was a good thing. You know, try and, try and drive a digital computer now and you'll be in trouble. But that's what they did. And it's funny, even the Beatles had to do it on the slide. They had to do it on the quiet because if the EMI operatives and the bosses here had found out they'd been abusing the equipment, they'd have been in trouble. I mean, it's fun to think at the time. But revolution was a case in point. It was, it was John Lennon saying what he's known for. The funny thing is about lyric, if you think about if you say on a revolution, you can count me out, is what he says. Well, he was actually saying, he did actually say at the time, the only way you're going to tie me to a barricade is with flowers, because he was kind of a, an angry pacifist, if you like. But the song was recorded, and it was recorded basically on, on one track live, um, two guitars, probably John and George, and drums on the track. And then what they did is they then overlaid more drums on top of those. They put, they put another track of snare drum and claps. And what they really wanted to get is the strongest driving rhythm track as possible. And there's about three, four tracks of this going on until they've got something that's compressed and angry. And it wasn't until they were happy with what they had that they then added the bass guitar and the vocals and the guitar solo and the, and the, and the keyboard solo. But the root of the track was kind of overlaid guitars and overlaid drums driven as hard as they possibly could. It's amazing if you think about it, they were doing this to be released as a single. Musically, Revolution is a homage to John Lennon's early influences. It's, it's, it's kind of Chuck Berry on overdrive, the double stopping guitar to begin with. Um, the fact it's based kind of around a 12 bar. It's kind of John Lennon's sort of twist on this world, where a lot of the 12 bar stuff was kind of, you know, polite, lyrically, and sonically, Revolution was kind of as angry as you can get a 12 bar to be. Here's the tuning for Revolution by the Beatles. First string. Second string. Third string. Fourth string. Fifth string. Then sixth string. take a look at a way that we can approximate the tones for revolution on a modern high gain amp. Now in the performance track and in the actual recording of the Beatles revolution, the guitar is run directly into a microphone preamplifier and turned all the way up. There's no amp involved, no microphone involved. You just hear the clipping of the microphone preamplifier, which gives you a very unique and uh, instantly identifiable distortion. But uh, not all of us have access to vintage microphone preamplifiers, and especially for one song, it's kind of cost prohibitive. So using a modern high gain amp, what I've done is I've taken the input gain and I've turned it all the way up, taken the treble in the mid and turned it up a bit just to give you kind of a spiky treble and, and mid range, simulate a, a vintage sound. The bass is not turned up so much. Modern high gain amps have a, a pretty good bass response. And uh, that doesn't, doesn't necessarily jive well with, uh, with a vintage sound. So you, I just turned it up just a little bit, just to give you a little bit extra, but not so much that uh, it's all the way up. Uh, presence is turned back down, because we do have a lot of distortion, and sometimes adding too much presence to a highly distorted sound can make it a little harsh. 
And this sound, while it is really aggressive, it isn't exactly always harsh. So I backed off the presence a little bit to compensate for the input gain. And then the master volume is turned up quite a bit. Uh, uh, the power amp distortion is definitely sympathetic to this, this sound that we're trying to get. Now, if you're living with somebody else, uh, uh, turning up the master volume on your amplifier isn't always a viable option. Uh, uh, so in that case, using a fuzz pedal uh, or any other kind of overdrive pedal uh, that uh, approximate a vintage tone and, and then really just turning it all the way up. The whole point is to get as aggressive as possible. When you listen to this tone. And that input gain coupled with the power amp distortion it gets pretty close. It's not exact, but if you're playing with your, uh, with your rock combo and you've got that tone, I don't think anybody's going to complain. This is the introduction to the rhythm guitar for Revolution by the Beatles. The tuning is slightly uh, lower in pitch than standard. Refer to the tuning video for help with that. Uh, relative to the guitar itself, however, the song is in the key of B. And uh, despite the lyrics and the overly fuzzed guitars, uh, this is really, really a, just a straightforward rock tune. The Beatles were supreme at playing up-tempo R&B uh, songs, and the, the riffs that we're going to be learn, learning throughout this tune definitely depict that. So. We're going to be learning right now the first, the second, and the third verses of the song. And they all have a little bit subtle variation on, on, the, uh, on the riff, though the basic structure remains the same throughout. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the first verse. So we're going to start out with a riff based on a B5 power chord. Your first finger is going to go on the seventh fret of the sixth string, third finger on the ninth fret of the fifth string. Uh, pick the sixth string, pick the fifth string, come back to the sixth string, pick the fifth string again, but this time pick it and then hammer on to the eleventh fret of the fifth string with your pinky. And you want to use your fingers to, to kind of limit uh, how these notes ring out. You want to definitely give it a staccato feel. So lift up your fingers after each note just off of the fretboard. Don't lose contact with the string or your position. But just lift them up ever so slightly just so you can control how these notes ring out to, to give it a nice rock and roll feel. So let's play this B5 riff five times at the beginning. <laughs> Next it comes down to an E5 riff, which is the same frets, just different strings, and it's the same riff, same pattern. Bring your first finger down to the seventh fret of the fifth string, third finger down to the ninth fret of the fourth string, pick the fifth, then the fourth, pick the fifth, pick the fourth, and this time after you pick it, hammer on to the eleventh fret with your pinky. So do that riff four times. Come back to B5 and do that four times. Do the B5 riff again five more times. E5 four times. And then we're going to resolve to F sharp five. Same pattern. It's just back onto the sixth and the fifth strings, and it's different frets. First finger goes onto the second fret of the sixth string. Third finger onto the fourth fret of the fifth string. Pick the sixth, then the fifth, then the sixth, and then pick the fifth string again, and this time with your pinky hammer onto the sixth fret of the fifth string. And do that riff four times. The second verse follows the same exact pattern, 
but just uh, when you come back to the B5 chord the second time to do it four in a row, he adds a little bit of a variation in the riff. Let's give it a listen. Start out with B5 five times. Then E5 four times. Back to V5, and this is where it changes up just a little bit. Let's listen. So you start out with the riff normal twice, and then you're just gonna go between hitting the sixth string and doing the hammer on three times. Now you're gonna bring your third finger down to the ninth fret of the fourth string, keeping your first finger on to the seventh fret of the sixth string. Pick the sixth string, then pick the fourth string, and then hammer on to the eleventh fret of that same string with your pinky. I'll play it for you. And then you finish out the verse the same way you finished out the first verse. B5 five more times. E5 four times. Then F sharp five four times. The third verse has the same little variation. It's just that the, at the end, the last hammer on stays on the fifth string. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Start out with the B5 five times. E5 four times. Back to B5, do the riff normal twice. And then you're gonna go between hitting the sixth string and the hammer on on the fifth string four times. So you just stay on that hammer on on the fifth string. Do five of the B5 riff, four of the E5 riff, and four of the F sharp five riff, and you'll end up at the last and final chorus. Let's take a look at how to play the chorus now. When you talk about destruction, don't you know that you can count me out? The chorus throughout the song is identical. Let's take a look at how to play one of them. So we're going to start out with a C sharp minor chord, but this one's going to be slightly different in that you're going to be f fretting with your first finger. You're going to do the bar across all six strings here at the fourth fret. Third finger is going to be at the sixth fret of the fourth string. Pinky's at the sixth fret of the third string. Second finger is going to be at the fifth fret of the second string. You're going to strum all six. And then go to an F sharp five chord. First finger is going to be at the second fret of the uh, sixth string. Third finger is going to be at the fourth fret of the fifth string, and put your pinky at the fourth fret of the fourth string. Back to that C sharp minor chord, and then we have this turnaround. A five. First finger is going to uh, bar here on the second fret of both the fourth and the third string, and strum the fifth string open. So you'll be strumming five, four, and three. Then a B5 chord, first finger here on the second fret of the fifth string, third finger is going to bar here at the fourth fret of the fourth and the third string, strum five, four, and three as well. And then a G sharp five chord, first finger is going to go on to the fourth fret of the uh, sixth string, and third finger is going to go on the sixth fret of the fifth string. So it's A, B, G sharp. Hit it three times, and then we're going to go down to F sharp five and do triplets. So one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three. Back to the same B5 riff from the verse twice. E5 twice. B5 riff twice. E5 twice. 
E5 twice. E5 twice. And then we have the chorus turn around. Let's hear it. So start with your first finger here on the sixth string, second fret, and you're gonna kind of bar it all across the sixth, the fifth, and the fourth string here. So pick the sixth string at the second fret, pick it again. Now you've got the second fret on the fifth string barred with that first finger. Pick that and then hammer on to the fourth fret of the fifth string here with your third finger. Then pick the second fret on the fourth string, which you should have barred. Pick the sixth string, second fret again. Pick the uh, second fret of the fifth string and do the hammer on. And this time, add your pinky to the fourth fret of the fourth string. Play for you slowly. And then do the same riff again without that introductory F sharp. So here, I'll play it for you. And then it's back to the verse. Let's take a look at the rhythm during the solo and the outro next. Let's take a look at the rhythm guitar parts to play underneath the solo and then finally the outro of the tune. I'll play the rhythm guitar part for the guitar solo uh, slowly here for you. Let's listen. So you start out with the same B5 riff from the verse, five times in a row. E5, four times. And instead of doing the same F sharp five riff from the verse, we just do the chorus turnaround riff four times in a row. It's the same riff from the chorus. And then it's to the third verse. During the outro, you'll hear the Jerry Lee Lewis style piano and uh, John Lennon screaming, all right. And we have B5 twice. E5 twice. Back to B5 twice. E5 twice. B5 twice. E5 twice, F sharp, and then C to B. So you do that F sharp chord bar all the way across all six strings here at the second fret. Third finger goes onto the fourth fret of the fifth string, pinky on the fourth fret of the fourth string. Second finger goes onto the third fret of the third string. Strum that. And then you're going to take this exact same shape and slide up to the 8th fret. So your first finger is going to be barring across uh, all strings at the 8th fret. Third finger on the 10th fret of the 5th string. Pinky on the 10th fret of the 4th string. Second finger on the 9th fret of the 3rd string. Strum that. Then take it and slide it down one fret to B. First finger barring all the way across all six strings at the seventh fret. Third finger at the ninth fret. Pinky at the ninth fret of the fourth string. Second finger on the eighth fret of the third string. I'll play the outro. And that's the end of the rhythm guitar here for Revolution. Let's take a look at the lead guitar next. This is the performance of the rhythm guitar for Revolution by the Beatles.
that you can count me out Don't you know it's gonna be Alright Introduction to the lead guitar for Revolution. We'll be taking a look at the, the intro lick and then some of the licks that are used to fill the space in the verses. Uh, the thing to remember with this is, like most rock and roll, it's more important to be rhythmically accurate and rhythmically aggressive when you're playing this. And sometimes it's better to play the wrong note at the right time than the right note at the wrong time. So your approach should be one of, uh, of aggression and, and uh, rhythmic accuracy. So with that in mind... Let's uh, take a listen to the intro lick. So you start out with kind of a Chuck Berry lick. Take your first finger and you're going to uh, bar across either the fifth or the sixth fret of the first two strings. It doesn't matter because you'll eventually be sliding up here to the seventh fret. And then including that slide, give me four groups of three. And again. And then you have this lick. So take your first finger, you're going to put it on the 10th fret of the second string, and just push it right out of tune. Then come to the second, uh, second finger, 11th fret of the third string. Back to the 10th fret, second string. Third finger on the 12th fret of the second string. Pick that and then bend it, a full step, and then with your pinky, grab the 12th fret of the first string. And then we have some, some uh, licks that fill in the space in the verses here. So let's take a listen to those licks as they, as they happen in the first verse. So 
So you start out with this riff based on a B major chord. Your first finger is going to bar on the fourth fret of the fourth, the third, and the second string. Pick the fourth string, and then you're going to hammer onto the sixth fret of the fourth string with your third finger. Then you're going to lift up that third finger and then just strum the fourth, the third, and the second string. We should have that bar waiting. And it's this kind of style riff here that, that we're going to be doing throughout the rest of uh, the verses. So. so that's a B major riff. And the second time around, you're going to want to do the same riff, just up an octave here at the 16th fret. You're going to pick the fourth string and hammer on to the uh, uh, 18th fret of the fourth string. And then strum the 16th fret on the fourth, the third, and the second string. So it starts out at the fourth fret, then at the 16th fret. Next, we're going to do some chords underneath the E. Let's give it a listen. So with your first finger, you're going to bar across the ninth fret of the fourth, the third, and the second string. Pick the fourth string and hammer onto the 11th fret with your third finger. Now add your pinky to the fourth string, 12th fret, and keep your first finger barred so it's covering the ninth fret on the third and the second string. Strum the fourth, the third, and the second string. And do that same exact lick again. Then come back up to that high B major riff here at the 16th fret. Do it four times in a row. Come back down to the 9th fret, where your first finger is going to bar across the 9th fret of the 4th, the 3rd, and the 2nd string. Do the same exact riff that you did the first time here at E, just once though. And then the second time through, we're going to do the hammer on the 4th string to the 11th fret. But this time we're going to resolve to just the bar on the 9th fret of the 4th, the 3rd, and the 2nd string. So it'll go. And then... And then for the F sharp chord, we have... Take your first finger, you're going to bar on the 4th fret of the 5th and the 4th string. Pick the 5th string and hammer on to the 6th fret of the 5th string. And then strum the 5th and the 4th string. And then... That'll lead us to the chorus. One time through the chorus, and then it's to the second verse. Where we're doing the same kind of philosophy, just a little bit of a variation. Here I'll play you the second verse uh, lead fills. So we start out with that same B major riff up at the 16th fret, the same one we did in the first verse. You do that twice. Come down to the 9th fret, we'll be doing that E major riff. And the first time, we'll end with our pinky on the 12th fret of the 4th string. And then the second time, we'll resolve to just the bar on the 9th fret. Come up to the B major riff four times in a row. Then down to E5, and then uh, the, the E major riff, and we're not going to be adding our pinky to either of these. We're just going to be resolving to our bar on the ninth fret of the fourth, the third, and the second string. So pick and hammer onto the eleventh fret, and the bar chord, and again. And then for F sharp, we're going we're gonna to change it up just a little bit. Take that, and slide it up to the eleventh fret, your first finger on the fourth, the third, and the second string. Bar across all those strings at the eleventh fret. Pick the fourth string and hammer on to the thirteenth fret of that fourth string with your third finger. And then strum the fourth and third and second strings together, all at the eleventh fret. And then just strum four, three, and two at the eleventh fret. Should sound. Back through the second chorus, and then it goes to the guitar solo before it ends up on the third verse. Now, in the performance, uh, the lead lick overlaps over the beginning of the third verse. 
So in the actual recording, it comes back to that B major riff here at the 16th fret, and it'll do it twice. But in the performance, you'll only see, it, see me do it once. But in the actual recording, it does happen twice. So let's listen to the, to the third verse with that B major riff twice at the, at the beginning. So do the same uh, B major riff twice in a row. And then for this E, we've just got a little bit of a variation. Let's listen. So come down so that your first finger is barring the ninth fret on the fourth, the third, and the second string, like always. Do the hammer on to the eleventh fret of the fourth string after picking just the fourth string. Then strum the fourth, the third, and the second. Now strum just the third and the second. Now add your pinky to the 4th uh, string, 12th fret, and strum just the 4th and the 3rd. So let's hear that. Again. Back up to the B riff four times. Down to the E riff. First time, resolve to just the bar. Second time, add your pinky to the 12th fret of the fourth string. And then we're going to come up and do the F sharp 5 riff high this final time. First finger is on the 11th fret of the fourth, the third, and the second string. Pick just the fourth string and hammer on to the 13th fret. Strum the fourth, the third, and the second string, and then do it exactly the same way again. And that's it for the third verse. Let's take a look at the uh, licks that we'll be playing over the chorus. When you talk about destruction, don't you know that you can count me out? Let's take a look at some of the lead licks for the chorus. It definitely is one of the the key elements of making this chorus sound like the actual tune. In the performance, the lead guitar will mimic exactly the chords that the rhythm guitar is playing at the head of the chorus. I'll demonstrate. But after that triplet section is where things get different. Let's give this a listen. So you start out with that low uh, B major lick that we did from the verse, hammering on on the fourth fret of the fourth string to the sixth fret, and resolving that B major chord with your first finger barred at the fourth fret of the fourth, the third, and the second string. And then we have to go into one of the coolest uh, licks ever written for rock and roll. Again, the Beatles were really supreme at playing this uh, up-tempo R&B stuff. Start with your first finger at the seventh fret of the fifth string, and you're going to do two sets of triplets. So you'll be hitting it six times. Make sure you alternate pick it. Put your third finger onto this ninth fret of the fifth string, pick that, and slide it to the eleventh fret. Bring your first finger down to the ninth fret of the fourth string, pick that, and then hammer onto the eleventh fret with your third finger. And then with your first finger, you're going to bar on the seventh fret of the first two strings. And then you're going to uh, pick those, and then pick it again, and then hammer on to the ninth fret of the second string. And then hit just the first two strings on the seventh fret by themselves. So let's play that slowly. Next we have... So the same introductory lick, but this time you're going to go up high to the 16th fret 
of the third and the second strings with your first finger. And then resolve with the same hammer on at the seventh fret of the first two strings, hammering on to the ninth fret of the second string with your third finger. So let's hear that again. And then the last lick. One more time. So start out with those triplets, uh, two triplets in a row here on the seventh fret of the fifth string with your first finger. Then with your third finger, pick the ninth fret fifth string and slide up to the eleventh fret. And then your first finger is going to grab the ninth fret of the fourth string. Back to the eleventh fret on the fifth string with your third finger. And then we'll end with an F sharp octave. Third finger on the fourth fret of the fourth string. And then your first finger on the second fret of the sixth string. Same chorus intro for the second chorus. And, uh, and after the triplets on the F sharp, we go into the, the lead lick specific to the chorus. This time, instead of starting out on the, uh, the low uh, B major chord, he starts out on the high B major chord. I'll play the second chorus. So we start out here at the 16th fret, do that same B major lick from the verses, hammering on to the uh, 18th fret of the fourth string. And then you do... Same exact lick from the first chorus, ending, resolving here on the 16th fret of the third and the second strings. And then coming to the seventh fret of the first two strings and doing that hammer on to the ninth fret. I'll play it for you one more time. And then here's where it gets different. I'll play it for you slowly again. Start with your first finger on the seventh fret of the fifth string, pick that, and then your third finger is going to pick the ninth fret on the fifth string, slide up to the eleventh. First finger on the ninth fret of the fourth string, pick that, pick it again, and then slide up to the eleventh fret, and then with your second finger grab the twelfth fret on its top string. And then first finger is going to bar on the seventh fret of the first two strings, hit it. Hit it again and then hammer on to the ninth fret of the uh, second string with your third finger. And then resolve with just the first two strings. And then finally we have. So start with your first finger on the seventh fret. The fifth string, pick that. Third finger is going to the ninth fret of the fifth string. Pick that and slide up to the eleventh. First finger grabs the ninth fret of the fourth string. And then with either your third or your second finger, grab the ninth fret again on the fourth string. Pick that and slide up to the eleventh fret. And then with your first finger, go to the ninth fret of the third string. And then finish with that same F sharp octave. Third finger on the fourth fret of the fourth string. First finger on the second fret of the sixth string. Play that lick for you again. One more time. Then it heads to the guitar solo before uh, uh, one more chorus. And then, uh, and then we have uh, the final chorus. The lead guitar kind of bleeds over the final chorus. So uh, one of the licks I do not play in the performance, but it's the exact same lick as from the first uh, chorus where you go up to the 16th fret. I'll play it for you. And then that same exact lick again. Again. 
same exact lick from the first chorus. And then here's our uh, uh, resolve lick. First finger on the seventh fret of the fifth string. Two triplets. Third finger on the ninth fret of the fifth string. Pick that and slide up to the eleventh fret. First finger is going to grab the ninth fret of the fourth string. Back down to the eleventh fret on the fifth string with your third finger, and then end on the the uh, fourth fret, uh, that F sharp octave. Third finger on the fourth fret of the fourth string, and then a first finger on the second fret of the sixth string. So here's the third chorus. And again, in the performance, that last lead lick kind of bleeds over the first lick of the chorus. So in the performance, you'll only see me playing the second and third lead licks on the last chorus. All right, let's check out the main guitar solo next. At the beginning of the lead uh, introduction, I said it was more important to play with rhythmic accuracy and aggression than it was to be pitch perfect. And nowhere is that more apparent than in the solo. Some of the steps uh, in the bends are sometimes uh, a whole step, a hole and a quarter, a half step, a whole step. It fluctuates wildly, and that's part of the uh, part of the fun of this solo and part of the fun of the sound. It sounds completely spontaneous and uh, completely made up in the spur of the moment, which is a very rock and roll thing. So let's listen to the the solo. I'll play it for you slowly. So we start out with a uh, your third finger on the 14th fret of the second string, and your pinky is going to be on the 14th fret of the first string. You're going to pick both of those strings, but you're just going to bend just the second string up a whole step. And on the actual recording, sometimes it's a whole step, sometimes it's a hole and a quarter. It sounds a little sharp and a little out. So give it uh, give it all you've got and uh, bend uh, bend and pick the first string at the same time seven times. <laughs> Again. Next up, we have kind of an old school R&B double stop lick. Start with your second finger here at the fifth fret of the third string. Pick that and slide up to the seventh fret. Add your third finger to the seventh fret of the first string. Keeping your second finger down on the third string, you want to slide the whole shape back down to the sixth fret. Now bring this down, both of those fingers so they're both on the fifth fret. And then with your second finger, you're just going to barely touch the second string so it doesn't sound out. You'll have a nice clean note on the third string, a dead note on the second string, and a nice clean note on the first string. And then do the same shape, but just down on the fourth fret. So let's hear that. Then we finally have... So start with your first finger here on the fifth fret of the second string, second finger on the sixth fret of the third string, then your first finger on the seventh fret of the second string, third finger on the ninth fret of the second string, first finger on the seventh fret of the first string, and then we have, he kind of slides into that seventh fret note on the second string four times, and then you're going to hit it another eight times with really aggressive vibrato. And then you're going to start laying into that note. Give it a half step bend and bring it back. You're going to do it 10 times. Was that 10 times? I'm not sure. That's part of the chaos of this riff. And then at the end, you just kind of want to 
fluctuate, just let your first finger do the do the uh, uh, the walking up and down that half step. Then at the end of the last chorus, you'll hear uh, you'll hear it come in with uh, this, a double stop lick that's reminiscent of what we played at the beginning of the solo. So start with your third finger here at the 14th fret of the second string. Pick that and bend it up a full step. Add your pinky to the 14th fret of the first string. And you're gonna do that lick seven times in a row. And then you're gonna start hitting them both together instead of hitting them separately. And you're gonna hit them both together seven times in a row. And on the seventh, on that seventh one, you're gonna fluctuate between them. Like so. Resolve to the twelfth fret of the second string with your first finger. And then your second finger is gonna to go to the thirteenth fret of the third string. At the very end of the solo, he saves his most dissonant note for last. Place your pinky onto the 21st fret of the first string, and then your first finger is gonna go onto the 14th fret of the second string. At first, it, it happens at the all rights of the outro. The very first all right you're gonna ignore, but the second one you're gonna do in, uh, in the same rhythmic time as the all rights. So do it three times like that. That's once, twice, three times, and then after that, it's on. Just tremolo pick it, pick both of those notes, do the bend, create as much havoc as you can. It's a really kind of a jarring and dissonant end to a very jarring and dissonant rock tune. So I hope you've enjoyed it, and that's Revolution by the Beatles. This is the performance of the lead guitar for Revolution by the Beatles. Destruction. Don't you know that you can count me out? Don't you know it's gonna be all right? For people with minds I hate But well, all I can tell you is whether you have to wait Don't you know it's gonna be
instead But if you go carrying pictures of jam and now We ain't gonna make it with anyone anyhow Don't you know it's gonna be 